Campus Fellow at the University of Eternal Environmental Humanities. Hannah also works in animal studies and has written on topics including gay frog memes and queer ecologies of Tiger King. Thank you so much, Hannah. Thanks, Caroline, and many thanks um, to, to Izzy, Caroline, and um, Josh for um, inviting me today. I'm really excited to hear these papers. Um, so, yeah, um, we're going to begin um, with um, Professor Joshua Paul Dale. Um, so, Joshua is the author of Irresistible How Cuteness Wired Our Brains and Conquered the World, published by Profile Books in 2023 and a professor of American literature and culture at Chiro University in Tokyo. Um, so today Joshua's talk is titled, The Egg Came First, Cuteness in Cross-Species Bonding and Domestication. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Hannah. And thanks to Caroline and Isabel for organizing this seminar and Todd as well. I'm really glad to be speaking here today. Today, I'll try to answer a central question about animal and human cuteness. It's the chicken versus the egg question, namely, which came first, a cute appearance or the emotional response to cuteness? If the chicken came first, then cuteness was adaptive and babies slowly grew cuter over time because the cuter ones were likely to receive more care and thus to survive. On the other hand, if the egg came first, then we somehow developed the emotional reaction to appreciate cuteness even before babies became cute. But how could that have happened? I'll attempt to answer this question by exploring the deep relation of cuteness to animal domestication and possibly the domestication of us, Homo sapiens. This is Conrad Lawrence's child schema. Eight decades of research has shown that these are the traits that most people find cute. And they are all neotenous traits, which, though they are associated with youth, also appear in adults of some species. Neoteny is the persistence of juvenile traits and behaviors into adulthood. We could call it a form of cuteness rooted in biology. Along with visual traits, neoteny also encompasses certain behaviors that are characteristics of a young animal socialization period, such as curiosity, openness, and approachability. I believe that neoteny made it easier for us to bond with other species, and in the case of domesticated animals, for them to bond with us. Through neoteny, cuteness influenced our evolution. During human evolution, we grew more neotenous over time until we became the most neotenous of all mammals. Think of the appearance of Homo sapiens compared to that of Neanderthals or apes. Adult humans resemble baby apes more than we do adult apes. We change as we mature, of course, but these changes are less extensive than those of apes or the wild ancestors of domesticated species. Neoteny was long observed by scientists, but until recently, there was no convincing theory to explain why our neotenous appearance is important. We'll get to that in a minute, but for, for now, I want to note that neotenous behavior has long been characterized as vital to our evolution. Stephen Jay Gould wrote that neoteny made adult homo sapiens into permanent children. He was referring to our enhanced ability to remain curious and learn new things throughout our lives. Conrad Lawrence held the same view. An attempt attempting an experiment attempting to domesticate foxes has been running for over 60 years in Siberia. For all of that time, researchers chose only the friendliest individuals to breed the next generation. The results are astonishing, for they seem to have created a newly domesticated species, foxes that eagerly approach humans, remain tame throughout their lives, and pass that quality on to the next gen generation. And you can see me meeting one of them in this photo. Over the course of the experiment, the fox's appearance has also changed. Their snouts and jaws became shorter and their faces widened. Some even have floppy ears and curly tails. The fox experiment shows that selection for a single trait, friendliness, is the precondition for a cascade of neotenous changes that result in both tame behavior and acute appearance. The foxes tie the visual aspects of cuteness found in Lawrence's 
child schema to the behavioral aspects of domestication, which enable two species to form close bonds. But how does this happen? A theory about the migration of neural crest cells has arisen as a possible explanation. A few weeks after conception, the embryos of all vertebrates develop special cells that appear where the spine will grow. A type of stem cell, these neural crest cells migrate to various parts of the body to assist in the development of different traits. A slight reduction in their number, a delay in their migration, or a reduced ability to proliferate produces different results in the many features they regulate. A striking number of these are associated with the domestication syndrome, including floppy ears, curly tails, smaller jaws and teeth, and shorter snouts and limbs. Many of these traits also appear in the child schema. In other words, they are cute. The effects of neural crest cells are not limited to appearance. In fact, they have a significant role in the development of the systems that regulate stress, fear, and aggression. Delays in neural crest cell migration possibly due to more serotonin in early development, result in smaller adrenal glands and lowered stress responses. Increased serotonin, which makes for a calmer, more friendly personality, was one of the first changes no noted in the Siberian foxes. The Siberian fox experiment suggests that tameness expressed by tolerance towards other species is the most important factor in domestication. For example, Dogs can make friends with each other in adulthood, a quality lacking in wolves. Domestication gave dogs the ability to view people as family and vice versa. Furthermore, dogs are neotenous, like wolves that never grew up. The neural crest hypothesis shows how tame pro-social behavior may be linked to a neotenous cute appearance. This is a roadmap to the way cuteness may have influenced our evolution as well as that of our companion animals. After all, if domesticated animals are neotenous like humans, and they become so due to changes regulated by the neural crest, then humans may well be domesticated like dogs and cats. I want to examine this theory next. The human self-domestication hypothesis has recently attracted much interest, but there is a huge debate about how it may have happened. For one thing, we're still capable of inflicting horrific violence. Were we even more aggressive earlier in our evolution? And if so, how were the calmer, more tolerant individuals selected to pass on their genes? Perhaps humans found a way to make tameness into an advantage. And I should say here that the level of, well, the level of violence in human societies is high, but the level of violence in chim chimpanzee societies is several hundred times higher than that of human societies, and they're our closest primate relative. So relative to other primates, our level of alliance is not high. Charles Darwin was famously worried about the peacock's tail because he couldn't see how natural selection could have resulted in such an extravagant feature without there being a survival advantage. He eventually decided that males must have evolved such tails because female peacocks preferred them. He proposed the theory of sexual selection by suggesting that if female peacocks preferred tail feathers with more eye spots, it could have led to male birds developing more and more ostentatious tails. Following Darwin's theory of sexual selection, women may have influenced human self-domestication by mating with men they preferred, such as friendlier ones. Kinder, more tolerant males would have been even more attractive if they were willing to help care for children. Conrad Lawrence disapproved of our tendency to find dolls and animals cute because he thought that our original instinct had been to care for only our own children. But what if caring for other people's children became an evolutionary advantage? Perhaps the cuteness response is triggered so easily because the advantages of caring for children outweighed the disadvantages. And even if it spilled over to encompass animals and objects, it was worth the extra energy expended. We cannot compare childcare and early Homo sapiens with that of our extinct ancestors, but we can look to other primates to see how they care for their young. In fact, most primates are fascinated by babies. The social biologist Sarah Hurdy feels that the neural underpinnings of the child schema are in place in apes. In other words, 
apes may feel something akin to cuteness. Still, whether or not they are felt to be cute, there is a big difference in how babies are cared for in primate societies. Ape mothers are notoriously possessive and won't even allow others to hold their babies. Human mothers, on the other hand, are willing to share the care of their infants with others, an ability that likely started at an early stage of our evolution. Sarah Hardy and other biologists argue that the cooperative raising of children, in which fathers, grandfathers, siblings, and other caregivers all play a role, may have enabled the development of the enhanced collaborative and, collabor and cooperative skills that mark the difference between humans and other primates. If humans are domesticated species, then our penchant for neo uh, neotenic cuteness may be due to changes in our behavior and appearance that began at least 100,000 years ago. Cuteness, in other words, may be more than just a preference. It could have been part of the reason we became Homo sapiens in the first place. But now we're back to the chicken versus egg problem. Cuteness may have influenced our evolution, but which came first, a cute appearance or the ability to feel cuteness? It's often assumed that newborn babies need for constant care is what triggers us to think they're cute. However, studies show that we regard a baby, whether human or animal, as most adorable when it has matured enough to explore and form connections with others. It's about five to six months old in humans. In other words, cuteness helps babies join the family. Similarly, domesticated animals can forge deeper relationships with members of other species than habituated wild animals who are raised by humans from birth. Evidence is mounting for this human self-domestication hypothesis, but it remains unproven. However, there are two paths by which cuteness may have made us human. Through a female preference for calmer, more tolerant mates, or through a pro proclivity shared by many child caretakers for cuter, more social babies. Both paths take cute affiliated behavior into account as well as appearance. The linguist Stephen Levinson proposes that these two processes may well have operated in tandem, a dual operation he calls cuteness selection. He proposes that a, prefer a preference for the adorable, for the friendly and cooperative made us mind readers who could reflexively grasp others' intentions and that this is what made language possible down the road. I've been posing a chicken versus egg conundrum about cuteness. Now we can restate it by asking, are we cute because we're tame or tame because we're cute? Even if we are not domesticated like the chicken, I think we've solved the puzzle. Perhaps like apes, we had the neural underpinnings of a cuteness response towards newborns. Then as babies took longer to develop and socializing them became more important, this response became stronger so that it peaked when most needed. Whether it took the form of a long, slow arc or a relatively quick cascade, whether by adaption or selection, I believe we consistently chose to be around the more open, curious, social individuals amongst us, traits increasingly signaled by youthful, neotenous appearance. In this way, our evolution was guided by a preference for cuteness and its associated qualities. The egg came first. But what does all this mean? For one thing, it helps to explain why neoteny has proved to be a durable trend in popular culture. For example, hundreds of cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse have grown progressively younger looking over the decades. In terms of animals, endangered species receive more attention if they are cute. Flat-faced dogs and cats are increasing in popularity because of their neotenic cuteness. This is not just in spite of the attendant health risks for these animals, but unfortunately because of them. The fact that these animals require extra care can trigger our cuteness response along with an adorably flat face. This is because the allure of neotenic features has literally been bred into us. Our attraction to cuteness has both benefits and drawbacks, but we are not prisoners of our biology. More awareness of the problems that our attention to cuteness can cause and greater knowledge of the deep impulses that lie behind it 
give us additional tools with which to understand and modify our own behavior. Thank you for listening. And uh, if you're interested, please check out my book. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Joshua. Um, so we're going to move on fairly rapidly, but we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so our next paper. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Isabel Gallimore, who is an Associate Professor in Creative Writing at the University of Birmingham and the author of the poetry collection Significant Other, um, which came out in 2019. Um, her AHRC Research Development and Engagement Fellowship project is Cuteness in Contemporary Environmental Culture, Developing Eco-Poetic Practice. Um, and today, Isabel's talk is titled, Hug Me, I'm Endangered, Cute Charisma in the Sixth Mass Extinction. Thanks so much, Hannah. Um, yes, so this is the title of my talk today, and it's part of a project which is looking at cuteness in contemporary environmental culture, which has been funded by the AHRC. And my talk today begins in a slightly strange place. It begins with a screamer pillar. So the screamer pillar is a bright red, large eyed caterpillar known for its incessant scream. Its habitat is limited. As far as I'm aware, the screamer pillar lives only in Springfield, where its number are dwindling. Alerted by a loud noise, Lisa and Marge find a screamer pillar in their garden. Just as they hear this noise, of course, Homer immediately goes in to kill it, to squash it. And just as he lifts that foot to squash the screamer pillar, a representative of the Environmental Protection Agency appears from behind a tree. He explains that the insect is an endangered species and must be safeguarded at all costs. The montage that follows shows Marge burping the screamer pillar and the screamer pillar emitting copious amounts of green vomit. The screamer pillar screams into a baby monitor at one point, and of course this baby monitor is set on Marge and Homer's bedside table. When Homer finishes reading a, bedside, uh, a bedtime story to the screamer pillar, it screams for another. The species appears to require the care equivalent to a human baby. And yet this, coupled with its insectoid form, is likely to induce a certain degree of disgust rather than the loving care that we might associate with a vulnerable newborn. What's enjoyable here is, of course, this incompatibility. If the animators of The Simpsons replaced the screamer pillar with a panda, the cute icon of worldwide conservation initiatives, the potential for amusement vanishes. Scientists and conservationists have long worried about the bias that comes with what is commonly known as charismatic megafauna. These are exotic and large species, usually mammals, and include such species as lions, tigers, elephants, humpback whales, and pandas. These animals tend to dominate public imaginations concerning conservation, in part because they are commonly used in environmentalist activism and feature heavily also in wildlife documentaries. In his writing on environmentalist, sorry, in his writing on non-human charisma, the geographer Jamie Lorimer creates a taxonomy of sorts. In the category of non-human charisma, Lorimer describes aesthetic charisma. And this is a kind of charisma which is applied to an animal we see in the world. And this might be an animal in the wild, or it might be an animal in a zoo, perhaps even an animal in a cartoon. Lorimer addresses with this idea of aesthetic charisma, cuddly charisma, which is what I'll be kind of talking about today. This he applies to Panda, but also to Disney's Dumbo. And to define it, he reaches for anthropomorphism and cites Emmanuel Levinas writing on the face, Kay Milton's writing on animals that reciprocate human gesture, and Conrad Lorenz's argument, as we just heard from Joshua, on human preference for organisms that look like human babies. Cited frequently by acute studies scholars, Lorenzo's identification of baby schema comprises a set of juvenile features, which we've just seen, big eyes often, chubby cheeks, and stubby limbs that suggest vulnerability and trigger in us a caregiving response. Yet I contend that Lorenz only can take us so far in thinking about cuddly or cute charisma. As the screamer pillar suggests, a subject that resembles a baby is not always charismatic. Furthermore, whereas Lorimer privileges the visual when articulating cuddly charisma, 
I want to explore how such emerges from the context and conditions of an animal being endangered. Charisma may seem easily identified in terms of what we find appealing in animals, but such a quality is surprisingly unstable. Cuteness and charisma change over time and with changes in the world at large. The red squirrel, as Peter Coates identifies, has become a charismatic species due in large part to its association with national heritage in the UK. Then there is, of course, the deep sea species, commonly known as the blobfish, who is attributed with negative charisma, but for this very reason, often its appeal seems to actually be increased. So the animal is currently used as the icon for the Ugly Animal Preservation Society, which gives supposedly less charismatic animals a chance. The context of competing with more appealing animals, such as pandas and whales, transforms the ugliness of the blobfish into something oddly positive. Ugly isn't simply ugly, but perhaps aglorable or ugly cute. As John Muellen suggests, the polar bear has turned from a terrifying beast into a delicate drowning creature in terms of the way that its endangerment has been communicated to us. And yet Muallam suggests in a recent interview that this charisma, this positive charisma held by the polar bear is already on the turn due to the fact it's become too political and overused as an environmental icon. In imagining extinction, Ursula Heiser writes that charismatic megafauna are so prominent in thinking about species loss because their sheer size, perceived majesty and fierceness makes it easy to cast them in narratives of tragic falls from grace. Valid as this argument is, my study reverses its logic by asking how these impending narratives of tragedy or these current narratives of tragedy influence the charisma of the animal in question. In a class I teach on cuteness and sympathy, a student tells me about a hedgehog shaped cookie that she buys from a bakery. It was the last one, she reasons, and I felt sorry for it. The cookie's status as something seemingly unwanted and alone is what generates its cute appeal. While a group of 10 puppies may be cute, when I imagine one puppy losing its way or being left behind by the group, this is sure to increase its cute appeal. Transposing these anecdotes into the context of animal endangerment and extinction is not intended to make flippant the severity of the situation at hand, but rather to indicate the affective range that these conditions can present. And to explore this in further depth, I turn now to analyze a conservation campaign run by the Durrell Wildlife Trust in 2013. So bringing to the fore the dodo logo of the Durrell Trust, which is in the top right of your screen, the lonely dodo, nearly four minutes in length, communicates the charity's mission to save species from extinction. The animation opens on the scene of a dodo playing a game of cards by himself on the island of Mauritius. Narrated by a toad who squats on a rock beside or behind the dodo, the film begins, the dodo is a lonesome bird. After the toad speaks, the dodo looks at him and asks, dodo? In a strained though hopeful squawk, the toad shakes his head. This question and answer forms the refrain of this conservation animation. Dodo? The dodo asks again as a tortoise wanders close by. The tortoise shakes his head. Although the dodo has been extinct since the mid to late 1600s, here the bird is presented as if it were an endangered species or an endling. The pace of the advertisement picks up as the voiceover announces, the dodo has decided he will be lonely no more. And at this stage in the animation, the dodo travels the world to search for his kind. On his international quest, he comes across uh, a polar bear, an elephant, a domestic cat, as you'll see pictured there, and a street advertiser wearing a donut costume, all of whom he inquires, Dodo? Having returned without success to the island, the Dodo slumps back against the rock where his playing cards lie scattered. Fast forward a little and the voiceover turns our attention to other animals around the world that are lonely too, facing extinction, being lost forever, such as the mountain chicken frog and the aguta, which is pictured in the right-hand corner there. It would appear that we are expected to transfer the narrative 
and emotional response to the dodo to these other species. And what is our emotional response? So looking at the animation's YouTube comments, we see, I think, a fairly consistent record of cute affect. And these are quotes that I'm now gonna read out. So in the YouTube comments, we have, oh, poor dodo, this is super cute. I will keep the dodo company, love heart. Just wanted to give him a cuddle. While we could say that a certain cuteness exudes from the kind of adorkable appearance of the dodo in the animation, the dodo's cute charisma relies, I think, on the representation of his vulnerability and loneliness as a species, the sad, innocent, and indeed limited rep repertoire of dodo is central to this portrayal. His witlessness regarding his doom situation only increases the awe factor of his lonely existence. So now I'm aware that a certain cuteness often is associated with anything animated in, in our culture today. Uh, and so I wanted to strip away this medium of the animated campaign and the heavy use of anthropomorphism that comes with it to see what happens. It's my contention that without seeing an endangered animal or an endling as necessarily lonely, their singular or small numbered status primes them for a certain amount of cuteness. And this is something I've discussed with Caroline and I think will come into Caroline's talk just after mine uh, in thinking about scale and how scale has a real impact on what we find cuter and not. And we can see this in the work of Julia Kristeva, where we understand that large numbers of non-humans, large numbers of animals, often introduce some degree of biophobic abjection and disgust resulting from us being confronted and overwhelmed by the other. The singular animal, on the other hand, is containable, and not only that, but an individual, something that we can identify with, that we might find some empathy with, and which is perhaps deserving of a name and further anthropomorphic construal. The endlings of which we are aware are extracted from their original habitats and brought to various conservation centers to enable opportunities for captive breeding and to receive specialist care. However, the process can't help but decontextualize the non-human in a manner that conveys a certain degree of domestication and objectification, and perhaps going back to Joshua's discussion around domestication in particular and cuteness. In his detailed study of the Dudleyer succul succulent species, Jared Margulies describes how the beauty of these plants is tied up with the ecological relations that they keep. Removed from their landscapes, the plant's aesthetic shifts. Intercepted by new desires concerning cultivation and commodification, the Dudleyer becomes a cute little thing. It is not difficult to see how Margulies' analysis can be implied to Tuffy, who you'll see as a, an enamel pin on the right-hand side of your screen there, Tuffy was the last Rab's fringe limb tree frog who in 2016 went extinct and in the process of doing so became something of a cute celebrity in popular discourse concerning extinction. Featured on a racing car, featured in Racing Extinction, the film, and commemorated alongside other endlings through a series of cute enamel pins by Corey Bing. While an endling may be understood to physicalize the abstract nature of species extinction, the endling is itself something of an abstraction, one that possesses a charisma that it wouldn't otherwise if it continued to live happily and safely in the wild. The circumstances of dying out would seem to give a new figurative lease of life to species not generally deemed charismatic. And this is especially in the case of endlings where we see Lonesome George, Tuffy the tree frog and Turgy, the faceless tropical land snail these belong to reptilian, mollusk, and amphibian classes, distinct from that traditionally thought of as cuddly species. Yet their extinction appears to replace any ew response with something more like an awe. Though I don't have time in this presentation to discuss it, it's perhaps possible in the Q&A to say a little about the word endling and how that word came to be in the way in which it perhaps has a connection to cuteness itself. But as I wrap up this paper, it's perhaps more important to ask, what good is our newfound appreciation for these species when these species are soon to be lost or already lost from the world? Like Lydia Pine, I'm curious as to what role endlings play, specifically what their cute charisma enables. 
as we are invited to do so in the Lonely Dodo, perhaps we can pay forward our affection and take better care of other species in order to stop them from becoming future endlings. There is evidence in cute studies that support such an idea, and this perhaps goes back to Joshua's discussion of the pro-social possibilities of cuteness, the fact that cuteness attracts people. There is, of course, a much darker way of looking at this topic, which is that if an animal's appeal is reliant upon its vulnerability and containability, then that animal's appeal diminishes, if not disappears, with the supposed hoped-for reality of that animal thriving in abundance. If our love for endangered species is conditional upon them being endangered, this cute charisma would seem to hold within it a potential for destructive patterns of behaviour. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Isabel, for another fascinating paper. Um, unfortunately, I can't, I'm trying to get my headphones <laughs> to, to connect so that I can get rid of echo, but it doesn't seem to be working. So I hope it's not too disruptive. Um, but um, we're going to move on to our final paper, um, which is by Caroline Harris, who is writer, artist and publisher. Caroline's PhD um, with Royal Holloway University of London explores the poetics of deer in relation to cute studies. Her latest pamphlet, A Summoning Spell for Lost Deer, 2023, is published by Osmosis Press. And Caroline's paper today is called The Cute Vision of the World is a World Without Nature, Challenges in Defining Non-Human Cuteness. Thank you so much, Hannah. <clears throat> um, thank you also to Izzy and to Joshua. You'll see some um, overlaps between our papers when I come to speak. My creative and critical research brings together deer, the poetic archive, and the emerging multidisciplinary field of cute studies. My aim has been to develop and evaluate acute poetics of deer. In particular, I'm interested in the potential for such a poetics to highlight, critique and subvert human attitudes towards deer, both as real beings and as literary subjects. Um, all of this means that for the past four years, I've been thinking a lot about what makes deer and other non-human beings cute, as well as what that means for them. For example, through the physical cutting out of deer from the printed images, my poetic pamphlet Cut Out Bambi, shown here, aims to highlight how deer are simultaneously cute and killable. We might awe and coo over them, but that offers only very limited protection from actual harm. Hundreds of thousands of deer are killed in road traffic accidents and by culls every year. The cute vision of the world is a world without nature, writes Daniel Harris, going on to explain that cuteness annihilates otherness, ruthlessly it represses the non-human and allows nothing, including our own children, to be separate and distinct from us. In thinking about my paper for today, I came back to this astonishing quote, which is from Harris's book, Cute, Quaint, Hungry, Romantic. I would not go as far as Harris does, but there are certainly ways in which, for non-human beings, cuteness seems to depend upon limiting criteria, such as enclosure or domestication, humanly relatable scale, and small numbers. The human desire for non-human cuteness can also be directly detrimental, as Joshua pointed out, in the breeding of dogs and rabbits for foreshortened features, which can cause health issues. In the rest of my paper today, I'd like to share some of the challenges and questions that I've come across in looking at defining specifically non-human cuteness. Discussions of the cuteness of animals often refer to Conrad Lorenz's kinder schema or baby or child schema proposed in the 1940s. As we've heard, Lawrence suggested that baby-like features such as small noses, 
big front facing eyes and round faces elicit a caregiving response in humans. This schema has been critiqued, tested and modified since, but in any case, deer only partially fit these criteria, even as babies. Fawns may have big eyes, but these are side facing, not forward looking. Other features are enlarged and elongated, huge ears, long muzzle, spindly legs. Natalie Angier has suggested that the baby schema can be extended. After speaking with researchers, she concluded that the human cuteness receptor is set so low that it sweeps in and deems cute practically anything remotely resembling a human baby or part thereof, and so ends up including the young of virtually every mammalian species. And even, Angier continues, woolly bear caterpillars and bobbing balloons. This might explain some of the cuteness of baby deer. With their spindly legs, uncertain gait and soft noses, they exhibit a human childlike vulnerability. Something that Walt Disney played on in the scene from the 1942 animated film Bambi, in which the young fawn keeps falling over with legs outsplayed. However, one of the things I have been struck by is how deer can be easily flipped from cute to pest, as when the diminutive and normally sweet looking muntjac deer display behaviors such as digging up gardens or breeding rapidly. The cuteness of deer is not just intrinsic and visual, but situational. As Angier's quote suggests, the aesthetic of cuteness and related affects may be applied to a broad range of beings and objects and their representations, from living hamsters to the Hello Kitty brand, from Instagram posts of kittens to commodities such as jewelry and even cars. Much existing writing on cuteness, with some exceptions, does not, however, fully distinguish between commodity objects, works of art and literature, human persons and non-human persons, all of which may be found prefaced by or argued to be cute. In the quotation from Daniel Harris, for example, he jumps within the same sentence from talking about the repression of the non-human to a statement about human children. Such illusions pose a challenge in trying to define the cuteness of living non-human beings. Thinking about deer, however, it seems crucial to differentiate between real deer, commodities such as plush toys, photographic and other representations of deer, such as those shared in social media posts, and humans evoking deer-like cuteness, such as cosplay practitioners. The elision may be appropriate for Daniel Harris's argument, since he sees the cutifying gaze as imposing the status of a thing and as simultaneously dehumanizing and anthropomorphizing. However, it means that the specific cute relationship between humans and non-human beings can become blurred, obscured, or overwritten by those other forms of cuteness. The language of aesthetics itself is problematic too, since in classical aesthetics at least, it allows only for an actively judging aesthetic subject and a passively judged object. Following this terminology, deer and other non-humans regarded as cute are denoted as aesthetic objects and this has implications for their agency. In an effort to recognize the agency of the so-called cute object, more recent theorists have turned to considerations of the affective, emotion prompting aspects of cuteness and also to new materialist philosophy. Um, Joshua, um, our first speaker, in the aesthetics and affects of cuteness counters the passive cute object by reframing the cute response in terms of social engagement, companionship and cooperation, 
drawing for his argument from scientifically based studies into human relationships with non-human beings. This reframing opens the way to a greater level of agency for the cute object, as well as to viewing the cute response in a more collegial way as, to quote, a performative act expressing affinity. There is also a growing body of research around Japanese kawaii fashions and their practitioners, including by Megan Catherine Rose with Haruka Kurebayashi and Rei Sayonji. A 2022 article by Rose and colleagues focuses on the thing power of cute objects, such as items of clothing and accessories. Here, new materialist thinking, in particular Jane Bennett's vibrant matter, is applied to cuteness in order to quote, to explore the ways in which Decora fashion practitioners form kawaii effective assemblages with the objects they collect and transform into fashion items. Such analysis is an important development. However, thing power tends to be applied to what are usually identified as non-living entities rather than to living creatures like deer. At the same time, the horizontality of new materialism has been criticized as having a flattened effect on power relationships. And power differentials, I would argue, are important when thinking about the cuteness of non-human beings. In the influential 2012 work, Our Aesthetic Categories, Zany, Cute, Interesting, Cyan Nye characterizes the cute as, to quote, an aesthetic response to the diminutive, the weak, and the subordinate. Cuteness, according to Nye, is about powerlessness and a commodified but complicated relationship of care towards the familiar and unthreatening. Cuteness, in Nye's analysis, can also involve feelings of aggression and acts of deformation. Other cute studies theorists have sought to move the arena of discussion away from the more negative aspects that Nye associates with cuteness. While Simon May in his book, The Power of Cute, questions whether cuteness really is about powerlessness. What if cute, he asks, isn't just about powerlessness and innocence, but also plays with, mocks, ironizes the value we attach to power as well as our assumptions about who has power and who doesn't. Those who have, like me, found it almost impossible to refuse their cat companion's demands for a lap to sit on, even with other important matters like seminar papers are calling, might well agree that the power dynamics between non-human beings and the humans they cohabit with are not simply one way. However, when in a comparison between the cute and the uncanny may asks, who has the power, the hunter or the hunted? Then the real lived and dying experience of hunted deer stands, I think, starkly against theory. Especially during this time of mass extinction and biodiversity loss, it feels vital to be attentive to the power relationships between human and non-human beings, including those of cuteness. And even when these cute relationships can promote positive affects and effects, such as real care and a sense of connection and responsibility. Through my research on deer, cuteness and poetics, I have sought, rather than presenting a closed definition of non-human cuteness, to instead raise some of the issues such as those I've spoken about today, and to develop and test a series of propositions about relationships and situations that serve to cutify non-human others, some of which have been touched upon, for example, in Izzy's paper. Many of these can be seen in the image here of kittens in bunk beds, taken from a Twitter post reproduced in an article published by online magazine Tenderly. These include aestheticization, domestication, enclosure or boundedness, being abstracted or extracted from their ecosystem, an anthropocentrically unthreatening number and scale, 
and of course, anthropomorphism. These propositions allow that cute relationships are not fixed, but mutable, so that cuteness for non-humans can be flipped, can dissolve, can become something quite different. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. <laughs>